Hello, I'm Michael Gaskins, and welcome to Where Do We Go From Here? The Future of African American Owned Media. African Americans make up 13% of the US population with $1.2 trillion buying power, yet they only own 25 of the nearly 1,400 television stations and 180 of the more than 11,000 radio stations. Given these small numbers, 53 years later after the historic 1968 Civil Rights Act, it is understandable that many African Americans feel that they are not properly portrayed or heard by the media. Meanwhile, five mega conglomerates, Comcast, AT&T, Viacom CBS, News Corp, and Disney own 90% of the US media. This issue raises the question, why are there so few media entities owned by African Americans? This 12 part docuseries will begin to answer that question. We'll hear from history making African American media movers and shakers while examining and celebrating our past, present and future place in media. My guest today is Stanley Green. There's a new voice in our community. Can you hear it? It's your voice, and it can be heard only on TSM News. We offer an interactive approach to watching the news. You can talk to us by phone or by internet. You make the call. So stop watching the news the old-fashioned way and get involved. TSM News. It's your news. Thanks, Stan, for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you don't mind starting out by um, introducing yourself and just tell them, telling us a little bit about your background in television and cable. I'm Stanley Green, and uh, I'm, uh, my background is, I, first of all, I go all the way back to uh, growing up in Philadelphia and being inspired by television, which was a relatively new medium, you know, in the 60s and 70s uh, and I remember yeah I'm still watching some of my old uh, television programs from that time and the one that influenced me the most as it relates to media was Bewitched and uh, in Bewitched uh, the uh, the main character Samantha would always twitch her nose and uh, things would happen you know people would disappear and reappear and that kind of thing so I became intrigued with uh, how that was done and uh, when I was in fifth grade, uh, we, I mean, we didn't have a lot of money and my mother was a single parent, six, uh, six uh, my five siblings, six total. And, but she bought a, a, uh, a movie camera and projector uh, for me. And it was what's called Super 8 uh, back then. And so I thought, okay, let's try this thing and making people disappear and reappear. And, uh, and I was able to successfully accomplish it. It was a big deal for me as a fifth grader uh, and so all of my movies from back at that time had people appearing uh, and disappearing. Uh, but fast forward past the University of Pennsylvania, you know, I started out in a telephone company uh, and on all kinds of assignments. But one of the most important elements of that was a, a course that I attended uh, in the uh, early 80s uh, called Applied Communications Fundamentals, where we learned about digital and this whole new world that would be coming out uh, with the zeros and ones and how all of that was done and it was moving from analog to digital. So I got my foundation and that understanding which became handy later uh, in the early 80s. Uh, but it was in 1990 that I really had the opportunity to get into media, actually a little bit of radio, but in terms of television media, it was 1990 when initially I was approached when I was looking to leave the telephone company to do other things, actually to, to do a financial business, where the opportunity to kind of follow my passion came about when I was asked to, as a 33-year-old, be a general manager at a cable TV system. And um, I came in, and of course, I had background through the telephone company around running operations, you know, from customer service to installation, the construction, the engineering. It was all under one roof for me, and I was able to turn that operation around uh, very quickly uh, with the help of that team. Uh, but through that process, of course, now I'm exposed uh, to, I'm a step closer to what I love because, you know, we were doing deals with all kinds of cable channels. You know, I, 
you know, uh, I, I needed to, to make BET full time. It was only on halftime and shared with uh, uh, the EWTN, which was a Catholic channel. Uh, and, and so we got into how we would do that and made that happen. There were new channels like TV, Food Network, Cartoon Network that were coming out uh, that, um, you know, we were able to get onto the network. And all of these folks would court the general manager of a cable system to get their channel on. Uh, but in addition to that, we had something called uh, uh, public access and leased access, uh, which enabled me, uh, was able to use the medium to actually help with our customer relations. When I came into the company, we were only four days in, and I told them I had the whole company together, and I said, we're going to fix you know, this, this cable system. We are. But what I'd like to do is go on the air. Um, uh, live once a month with our customers. So here I was now doing my first TV show, uh, and it was related to, uh, it was called the uh, Ask the Manager. Good evening, I'm Stanley Green, General Manager for Suburban Cable TV's Wallingford Cable System. Tonight presents another opportunity for each one of you to let me know how we are serving you, our customers. But but more importantly, how we can serve you better. And, and, and my employees tried to talk me out of it. They said, these people are going to really give it to you. <laughs> They're really upset. I said, well, you know, let's see. And I want to hear it you know, because they needed to have access to the person running the show. So I got on the air. I'm, a, I'm 33 years old, on the air with all these angry customers. And it turned out they weren't angry at all. They appreciated the fact that I was very, being very transparent. I was right there in their homes, all they had to do was pick up the phone and call me. And it was very powerful. It was, uh, and it, media is very powerful. It was powerful for our employees because they were able to see how I responded to our customers with a, a myriad of issues from um, cable outages to you know, missed installations um, to, hey, and that's how I first heard, the people in Chester, PA said to me, uh, which is predominantly African-American, we want BET on full time. And I thought, okay, well, you know, we got to figure out a way to make that happen. Uh, so it was my, my first exposure to, you know, having a, a, a media presence and understanding the real power of media. Because there were other people, people that were part of the board of, of, of directors for the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce. This was in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Other folks, next thing you know, I was appointed to boards. I was very involved in the community and influential positions because people who were in high places watched how I uh, dealt with the public. And uh, uh, we were actually on a, you know, helped the city of Chester out tremendously when they were in financial uh, troubles. Um, so it, uh, that was my first taste of the power of, of television and media. Uh, and then I went on from there to run the box uh, which was a music video channel I created um, the, uh, back in 1999. Uh, and we, we worked together. Mm -hmm. The uh, Tri-State Media actually came up with the name uh, Tri-State Media. And we had an element of that called Tri-State Media News that we nicknamed, uh, or for short, called TSM News. And that was one of the most uh, innovative and forward-looking things that we've ever done. Uh, and then was went nine months after we started, it was acquired by Comcast. Great stuff. Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier about um, cable networks coming to you to kind of get on the air. Uh, talk a little bit about that process. Sure. Well, you know, had to, back in in those days, I mean, like in the eighties, satellite uh, transmission really changed the game in terms of media. Because prior to that, uh, you know, you had cable systems, uh, but primarily they were in rural areas where, you know, because of mountain ridges and so forth, and I'm in an area like that now in Harrisburg, central Pennsylvania, it was very difficult to, um, for people to get the over-the-air signals. So, in fact, uh, cable TV was started in Pennsylvania. Um, and you know, they had to run cables, you know, down, you know, to the, uh, through the, uh, into the valley to 
to get a signal to folks. And so, but you basically had your regular broadcast channels just carried over cable. So you, you may only had four or five channels. But satellite, you know, a transmission changed that. And then people started coming up with ideas. Uh, Ted Turner had um, uh, TBS, Turner Broadcasting System, and TNT, Turner Network Television, back in the, uh, in the 80s when he took these regular stations and with, you know, with this new thing called satellite, they were able to beam the signal to a satellite and have it distributed all over the country. So it took a local station and made it national. And they were able to do, you know, really innovative program, a local program called Dancing on Air in Philadelphia became Dance Party USA. And I know the founders of that, you know, Mike Nice and, and uh, Jeff Serbin, uh, it became a national uh, phenomenon. And there was a lot of, of, of first uh, and pioneering uh, media ventures that came about because of satellite. So what they would typically do, the people who founded those networks would go, you know, cable system by cable system, you know, mom and most, and most of them were mom and pop cable systems, you know, running, uh, handling a small geographic area and, and pitch the, the person in charge of the cable system. Take them out to lunch. I mean, I love that part. You know, they, they take us out. They give us tickets to, for this or that. And uh, you treat it like kings and queens uh, because they wanted to, you know, make sure that, you know, when, when additional channel uh, opportunities were available, but that they could get in there. And, and so that would happen. But also, there were some very smart companies that would, in addition to working on the decision maker, would also work on the public. And MTV, when it came about, was absolutely brilliant in that. When I started in cable, it was about 1990, uh, there was this little tagline about cable, you know, uh, and, and I remember my installers are saying to me, yeah, you know, if, uh, this, this, the people on this block want, want, their, they want their MTV. They want their MTV. And they had a campaign, I want my MTV. And people would say, I want my MTV. But the only way you can get MTV was getting cable. So they made themselves a must have. They made themselves essential. Uh, and so most of the cable operators all over the country said, hey, we got to have MTV because MTV was how you would get the thriller video, right? Uh, they would break you know, artists uh, or great major releases of these videos that were, you know, productions, major productions. Uh, and that drove cable, believe it or not, in those early days. And then as we went along, there were new channels. And I said, as I mentioned, when I was in cable, Cartoon Network was brand new, Bravo was brand new, uh, Food TV Network. And I thought, who's gonna sit down all day and watch food and people <laughs> cooking? <laughs> and sure enough, um, that's a, that's a no brainer now, but, uh, but these were all of the ideas that, that folks came up with, but then they had to go out and, and, uh, pitch it. And I was on the other side when in 97, I became president of the box USA, which was a music video channel that competed against MTV in particular MTV two. And so, and I had to do the same thing. I had to get master agreements with big cable companies like TCI which is now Comcast, that was the largest cable company in the country at the time. And uh, actually that they had an a, a agreement that wasn't signed, wasn't completed, and I got in and quickly we got that done, that deal done. And that gave me the license to be able to go all across the country to the cable systems and say, hey, TCI has approved us to come in and pitch to you. They said, it, it's okay if we go on your cable system. Uh, in a certain market, we say, well, we want we, we'd like to replace your um, country music television, CMT, with a box that has nothing, you know, more than country music videos. And we can go into different markets and actually custom design, you know, this music video lineup. In Philadelphia, for example, uh, the Greater Media System, which serves South Philadelphia and Center City, had a different lineup of music videos in that particular case than than folks in Northwest Philadelphia. If, if someone was in, in South Philadelphia and talked to somebody in Northwest Philadelphia and they both had the box, uh, there'll be different videos playing. And, and so, you know, I had an opportunity to do what cable, what cable programmers would do 
and that is go around and try to court cable operators. And what we would do, what we did, is to try to get, as I mentioned, not only the cable operator, but get the masses involved. And what we created in Philadelphia, that was our test market, was a campaign uh, with the radio stations. We formed partnerships with Power 99 and Q102, and they played commercials promoting the box. You know, they played a commercial of a certain video and say, hey, that's available. It's number 397 on the box. Go get it. And we would uh, play commercials um, in that local market in Philadelphia for uh, promoting Power 99 and Q102. And we went a step further when it was all my idea. It actually wasn't my idea. You know, it was my brother's. You know, I sat in the dining room table with my brothers and uh, who were, you know, both had media experience in radio primarily. And uh, they came up with the idea of the, you know, strengthening the partnership that we already had, doing cross promotion. We hired a local marketing manager to get the people to say, we want the box, we want the box uh, on a cable system. Uh, and it worked out. Uh, we wound up uh, being purchased uh, by the largest cable operator, TCI, to be part of their new digital uh, cable system back then. You're about to experience the box. Music television you control. Box, the one and only box. It's good. You, know, you can choose whatever music you want. I know this. I saw this this morning. I think it's fabulous. I don't have that channel. Every day I watch it. Watching good videos. What's the box? The box is music television you control. 100% music television. All videos, all the time. Viewer controlled. Completely interactive. The box is a simple concept. It is the jukebox from a 50s malt shop, reinvented for television in the global village. These are the days of wild hitmen. The box works because it's simple. The box, they're calling for it. The interactive technology that drives the box is contained in freestanding computerized units located throughout the United States and abroad, in cable systems, TV broadcast facilities, and on satellite, too. Understand how the box works. It's never the same. From box to box, city to city, hour to hour, and day to day, every box is different. My project is about where do we go from here? Um, the need to have more black-owned media. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your dealings with the FCC? My initial dealings, I, I became a, um, a board member um, as I was kind of in 1993 or so, I was actually inducted into the National Association for Minorities and Cable Hall of Fame, an organization called NAMIC. And um, I was appointed to the board of directors of the Pennsylvania Cable Television Association, you know, where we would help to influence legislation uh, surrounding cable TV. Uh, we were also in a battle with my old uh, company, the telephone company, because they wanted to get into cable, and they are now in Fios, and they were saying that we're better than cable, and we were saying, um, hey, we do the same thing. We do fiber optics just like they do. Um, uh, so I was in, actually in, in, involved in testifying before legislators in Pennsylvania around that. But in that same year, 1993, and I was with uh, the vice president general manager of Greater Media Cable, uh, there was a major nationwide issue. And that revolved around customers uh, having challenges from a customer service perspective. And to, even to this day, there are challenges sometimes when people call cable, they don't expect to get the best treatment, you know, and the best service when they call their cable company. But it was at a fever pitch uh, back in those days because the industry was still relatively young and trying to work the kinks out. And so the FCC, as influenced by various legislators around the country and you know, various customer advocate organizations, put a freeze on cable increases. 
And that was disastrous to the cable industry. So um, I can actually recall uh, as we were trying to get a feel for, you know, the rulemaking and what was going on and seeing uh, also if we somehow in those areas where there may have been some gray areas can influence them in our favor, you know, made calls directly to uh, policymakers in the FCC. You know, I didn't sit back and wait, you know, for things to happen. You know, I was proactive and I said, okay, well, you know, we need to, you know, let them know that we're certainly interested in the public, you know, being treated fairly as well. Um, and we needed to know uh, what needed, what, what could be done. Uh, through, through those discussions with the FCC, it actually led me to experiment with something I called an a la carte offering, which is now almost where we are today with streaming uh, and where we are with being able to, to purchase certain cable channels or certain smaller packages where we package Bravo, Cartoon Network. Uh, there was some channel called Flix, was hit movies of 60s and 70s or something like that. Uh, and we said, okay, you can, you can get them at, you know, one was 99 cents a, a month, another was $1.50, and then, or you can get them in a package. Uh, but it was through those interactions with the FCC that we were able to, to come away with uh, our strategy. Now, um, the FCC landscape was interesting because they were doing things to uh, actually help minorities get ownership and expand ownership in media, radio stations, television stations, cable TV networks through something called a tax certificate. But that whole process was interesting. But yes, I've, I've had, you know, some, some dealings with the FCC. Yeah, talk a little bit more about the tax certificate. The tax certificate was an amazing vehicle, a tool, uh, because as we know in the world we live in today, uh, we're finding that while we thought we were making progress, there were other areas where we really weren't making progress. Where and it's through it was it's through um, the uh, law enforcement that we're able to see and technology, the combination of technology and uh, law enforcement that gives us a lens into the beliefs of a significant number of people. And now we were able to see that there are people that, that you know, a Rodney King, for example, being beat up wasn't just a one-off every 20 years. But this kind of thing somewhere in our country was happening all over the place. And, uh, and it was just a matter of how people perceived us and uh, unfortunately, in law enforcement, folks who have brown skin are, were perceived as and are perceived in many cases as folks who were, tend to be guilty and lawbreakers uh, rather than upstanding citizens. And there are people who are upstanding citizens who are painted with that broad brush and treated uh, poorly. Well, that's what we see now when we record these incidents. What we don't see is what happens in business and how many people are dismissed, you know, and overlooked. Um, they may be disregarded. Then we just, they just don't, won't do business with us because they may feel the same way as what we're seeing now with the others. Now they're not, we're not going to be brutalized by a business person, but they may not want to do a deal. They, you know, they, you know, see someone and say, Hey, let's go out to lunch, you know, I'm thinking about selling my TV station. You're interested in buying. Uh, we just went golfing and uh, I like you. I'm going to offer you to buy uh, my, my, uh, my radio station. Those are the kinds of, those are the ways deals happen and have happened and continue to happen. But we had no idea of whether we're in the mix for this as a people. But the reality is there are people that could have had ownership in those areas that you wouldn't even get a sniff, an opportunity. And so the tax certificate uh, was uh, uh, evolved because uh, folks recognized that something needed to change and there needed to be a way to get more people of color into ownership of this powerful, uh, powerful entity, uh, the media. And so, 
Uh, it may have been Frank Washington, I believe, who was maybe an FCC staffer at the time. It may have been in the 70s who proposed this. You can look it up. And it, you know, they put it into effect. And in the 80s and 90s, uh, we saw a significant increase in, um, you know, African American people of color ownership in media. And the way it worked was that if a, um, a person, uh, a Caucasian owner sold to a person of color, then, uh, you know, typically there's a capital gain. So if they bought a, a, a TV station for 10 million and they really wanted to sell it for 100 million, you know, that difference between what they bought it for and what they were selling it for is a gain. And then there's a tax on that gain. Uh, but the tax certificate basically said to them that your tax bill is going to be much lower than it otherwise would be if you would sell it to a person of color. And so there was a financial incentive then for uh, folks to sell. If they're going to sell anyway, why not go ahead? If I'm going to save money, because they know money talks, right? We heard it say money talks, everything else walks. And so, okay, well, wait a minute. I wouldn't even think about these people because they're just not in my circle. I'm not comfortable with right. them. Even if they, they may say, hey, look, I, I like them. I just don't deal with them. No, they're not in my circle. And, and now they're going, wait a minute, I can save how much money? How much money stays in my pocket as opposed to going to the government? Okay, here. <laughs> if somebody comes up with a, you know, with a, you know, black owner, uh, or if there's a, a person who owns a, you know, sy cable systems, radio stations, and they want to buy, I'll sell it to them. Uh, and what you had happen, uh, a lot of folks benefited. Now, some, you know, it wasn't so great. Uh, now, it was Comcast that put something together with, with uh, Lent, the Lenfest group back in 1989 to buy the New York Times cable systems. Uh, and they were smart enough <laughs> to savvy enough to put a black person in as the quote unquote head of the company, even though he only ha had about maybe 5% of the equity in the company. Technically, he had the majority votes and ownership, uh, even though he had nothing to do with running it, they ran it. But what that enabled them to do is have the seller save a lot of money and which also meant that they were able to pay a lower price than what they would all uh, 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 ordinarily pay. It was a win, win, win all the way around. Mm -hmm. uh, I was actually involved in the uh, management on the management team of that cable system because one of the owners, Jerry Lenfest, was a guy I worked for. The person who was the, the African-American technically owner was a guy named Bruce Llewellyn. So I sat in on those operational meetings. Uh, Bruce did very little operating, <laughs> uh, uh, but he still, had, he and his group had a little piece of a cable system. So the idea was everybody won, uh, even though technically it, it didn't give him the control that he should have had. Now, in other cases, you know, maybe uh, like uh, Urban One with Kathy Hughes, uh, she was truly, you know, an African-American owner and there were st stations that she was able to buy through that tax certificate program. And the great thing about her is that she and her son were truly operators as well. And it helped them to grow to a large size. But unfortunately in the nineties, probably the mid to late nineties, uh, that tax certificate program was eliminated. You know, unfortunately in my view, uh, not, not in my view, there's actually a book by Leo Hendry, who was the CEO of TCI, the largest uh, cable operator in the country, who, who actually said it in the book, uh, that that was, um, uh, that program was eliminated because of, of race. They didn't like the fact that Frank Washington um, was, uh, was going to take over uh, a multi-billion dollar cable system through the tax certificate program. Mm -hmm. uh, and they killed that deal and every deal going, you know, going forward from there, they eliminated the tax uh, uh, certificate program, and that combined with the 1996 Telecommunications Act sent African American Black ownership into a downward spiral, uh, to the downward spiral that we see today.
This is important to me because um, we're, we're hearing a lot about diversity now, and uh, which is a, a great thing. Um, but we're still not getting to the table in regards to ownership. And um, things are a, ho a whole lot more challenging today because, as you know, we have uh, Comcast, uh, CBS, Viacom, Disney. They own 90% of all media. What's left for us? What, what can we do moving forward? How can we uh, basically be invited to the table? to even get into ownership? Is it, is it possible this day and age? Um, it, it, it is possible. Well, I'll tell you what's going to be challenging. What's challenging is saying, invite me to the table and expecting them to do it. Um, there's a slim chance that that will happen because if they don't have to, they won't. Now, certainly all of the talk about diversity and inclusion and so forth um, may mean that some folks get invited to the table. Uh, I'm doubtful of that because what they'll do and what they have shown is any company that uh, they, they, they'll find a way to talk to talk. They'll have statements uh, and the company policy that's, implement, that's you know, at least stated you know, they're great on statements and great on, we have money, we'll give more money to the NAACP, $100 million pot, and we'll dole it out to all these organizations and keep them quiet, keep them off our backs. Uh, but the idea of saying, hey, you know, come in, you know, let's get your cable company on or your cable uh, programming network on, um, unless they're forced to, uh, just won't happen. And there were entities that when they were about to merge, uh, you'll have organizations like the NAACP, the Urban League, the National Action Network, and others who may say, hey, we got a problem here. Uh, you guys have not been you know, great with inviting you know, people who don't look like you to the table as you're doing these deals. And we're gonna step in and complain to the FCC. And so then that, that's when the companies will get religion and say, hey, uh, well, come on. Um, number one, we'll get you some money. Number two, um, we will we'll allow, we're gonna, we're gonna have you know, four more African-American owned or uh, people of color owned stations within the next five years. If you agree to leave us alone and let us do this mega deal. <laughs> And uh, there's certain networks like uh, Revolt, uh, the P. Diddy, and then Magic Johnson was involved in one called Aspire and others. They were dealing with some folks like, that had high profile because they said, okay, you guys can keep all the other, your other people off our backs. <laughs> so we got one. We got Magic. We got P. Diddy. The rest of y'all leave us alone. <laughs> and, uh, and they get them to agree uh, in exchange for us doing this and giving each of you folks some cash, you'll leave us alone. So uh, even with what's going on today, uh, where they, what they, you, you saw quick responses from a number of companies like, hey, why are you doing all this? 100 million, this company, oh yeah, we're doing 110 million, 150 million. Uh, but that's window dressing. You know, when it comes down to changing beliefs the beliefs they may have about people that may not look like them, uh, where they're comfortable enough to say, just as they'll, you know, you know, do, you know out golfing with someone, uh, they'll say, hey, you know what? I'm thinking about starting a new, uh, having another network on my, my chat, on my cable lineup. Uh, why don't you put something together, Bob? <laughs> they have that happen with people that they're, people that they're brought up, uh, not to view very favorably is the, is the big challenge. And the only way I think to get to your question, uh, the most powerful way and the, most, the, the way to ensure that it happens is for uh, people of color to do what they what all rarely do, and that is trust each other enough to pull our capital together to also decide where it has to be all economic. 
that we're economically, we're not going to support um, whoever we choose that we're not going to support. This is not a novel idea. Uh, this was done uh, over 60 years ago. But, uh, someone comes right out of Philadelphia, uh, Reverend Dr. Leon Sullivan, who told companies because people weren't being hired, people of color weren't being hired, well, guess what? We're not going to support you. And so, uh, and guess what? I mean, they, they picked a company, you know, let's say it was Tasty Baking, and then people wouldn't buy Tasty Cakes. They saw a dip in their revenue. And remember, when we talked about the tax certificate, this economic, uh, this is a capitalistic society. That is the root of our being. The reason why they were slaves is because of capitalism. The idea of making as much money as you can and spending as little as you can. So if you can get free labor, hey, you're a genius because uh, that's money you don't have to pay. Now, of course, that fast forward after slavery, uh, it was, hey, well, let's just take it to China because we don't have unions. We don't have to pay as much because the idea is making as much money as we can. And as a people, we're still missing it. Folks, we're doing all the protests and we're not dealing with the economics. You know, we may, de may deal with economics, some folks, if it comes to breaking a window and taking stuff out of a store, but the most powerful way is to do what Dr. Sullivan did those years ago. And those, and those folks said, okay, we're gonna start hiring people. We can't afford to lose money. Bus boycotts in the 1950s. Folks said, I'm walking for a year. I'm not taking a bus. And they say, ah, they're going to start taking a bus. Didn't start taking a bus. Those businesses, those bus companies were going out of business. And they said, okay, you can sit in front of the bus. It <laughs> doesn't mean that much to us. Mm -hmm. um, into, the, into the late 60s, with the start of what was called Progress Plaza in Philadelphia, the first African-American-owned shopping center mm -hmm. in the entire country, it happened as a result of an aggregation of capital. But Reverend Leon Sullivan, his church at uh, Zion Baptist Church in North Philadelphia, started the 1036 plan. They said, okay, folks, we want each of you in a congregation to put up $10 a month for 36 months. And then people from other churches, like 400 churches around the city, um, that pulled their, uh, got involved in the program as well. And when he went to the bank and he said, hey, I want to buy a shopping center, Mr. Banker, and the banker said, oh, I'm a reverend. You got to have some equities to, to start a bank. And he told his, uh, his colleague, okay, bring the bag over. He brought the bag, opened it up. You know, $400,000 in equities came out. And the banker came across the table and said, Reverend, I think we can do business. And uh, they bought uh, Progress Plaza, which is still in the, the first African-American owned shopping center in the country. It's in existence to this day. And yet with those successes, going well over 50 to 60 years ago with economics, we still, it still eludes us. We still want someone to, you know, say, hey, I'm going to include you when we can actually include ourselves. Um, in 1968, uh, the mountaintop speech, the day before, night before Reverend uh, Martin Luther King was killed, he made a speech and at the end of it he said i've been to the mountaintop everybody knows about that that's what's played on his birthday and so forth uh but in the middle of that speech he talked about economics he said look folks you know individually we are poor we're poor people he said but collectively we are worth more than all uh the countries in the world with the exception of nine just the african americans in 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 the United States of America. He said, we have over $30 billion collectively. And he said, that's power right there if we know how to pull it. He said it in that speech. That $30 billion today is not 100 billion. It's not 300 billion. It's not 900 billion. It is 1.3 trillion dollars in spending that uh, this community spends every year and there's nothing to show for it. So in part, yes, we want people 
to include us more and to be nicer and get us involved in deals. But the reality is the capital exists between us. If we just, you know, all of us texted $10 to a fund uh, that we would control, uh, you know, think about what we're talking about here. What, what's 10% of a trillion? It's a hundred, not million, it's a hundred billion dollars. And do you think that someone's going to say, I don't want to do business with you when we're going to pay 10% above what their asking price is? What happened? So we have the power, not individually, but collectively. And when we get that part together, we won't need to be wondering when somebody's going to include us uh, and why we have so little African American owned uh, station businesses. Uh, we would have, you know, unlocked the uh, that that puzzle. Um, the '96 uh, Telecommunications Act really decimated things when they said these big companies can get even bigger and bigger and bigger, and they just uh, devoured, you know, a lot of, you know, not just African American and people of color uh, own stations, uh, but smaller mom and pop uh, white stations as well. Uh, but again, the powers within each and every one of us to act collectively and reverse all of that. When that happens, everything changes. Wall Street changes. Um, so we'll get there. Hey, instead of trying to be invited to the table, we, we have to create our own opportunities. But at, at this rate, will there be anything left as these big conglomerates continue to basically eat up all of the stations that exist? Well, uh, it's a, um, a wonderful question. And again, Michael, I appreciate you having me uh, do this. Um, I think we have to look to the future and not to the past. Because technology has actually democratized media. Uh, the barriers to entry, we can stay locked on. We spent a lot of time talking about what was called traditional media. And so, yes, we, if we can collectively pool our money, we can go out and buy, you know, radio stations, television stations, and cable, t some, whatever cable TV mom and pops are left. But we don't need to do that. The reality is that anyone can start a television show as we speak. As soon as we hang up, we can actually go on a platform, Facebook, YouTube, platforms that didn't exist just 20 years ago. And, and start our own network. Individuals are doing it. A great example is uh, Roland Martin. Roland Martin is a journalist, and I'll never forget when he, he would, this guy didn't know who he was, and he would come on with these little uh, short clips, and he would end with, um, you know, that's, uh, I'm Roland Martin, and, uh, you know, that's my opinion, or something like that. Uh, what's yours? And and then he had a, a show uh, on on uh, TV One. Uh, he was a commentator on CNN. Uh, but then, because you know a lot, because of the pressure that some of the larger media entities, when they part of the fallout of the consolidation, was that the urban ones, the folks who were left of the world felt pressure to make money, to compete. And so what they felt was that public service type shows, information shows, informative shows, had to be cut out because they didn't produce great viewerships because people have been programmed to go for the reality stuff, drama, things that just you know will grab your attention. It's a train wreck and you have to watch it. Uh, so things that just inform people they had this, their viewers, core viewers, but it wasn't significant. It's like PBS. If PBS was just driven by ratings, they wouldn't exist. Uh, and NPR it just wouldn't exist. They exist on funding. Uh, so, but if you're driven by advertising revenue, your job is to get as many eyeballs as possible and listeners as possible. What do you resort to? The shock value and grabbing them. So the smaller entities that were left we're trying to do the same thing uh, so that they can compete. They didn't, they, they had to squeeze out 
all of the great community and public service stuff. So here's Roland Martin with a lot to say and very talented that if he's not on CNN, if they said, ah, we, you know, we, you know, we're okay now. We got some new, young, upcoming uh, journalists. And so now he's squeezed out. Now, you know, he, he's now looking for another job or whatever. But what he said was, wait a minute, this is a different day and time. I don't need TV One. I don't need CNN. I don't need MSNBC to be relevant. I'm going to take advantage of this new media, um, this, which is internet driven. So, I mean, I'm telling you, it's just about uh, um, four, five times a day, I got notifications that said, you know, Roland Martin, <laughs> and, you know, he's on. And you can click and he's on live or he's on recorded. I don't know how he does it. He figured it out. <laughs> and he has viewers and he came up with a revenue model. He said, hey, you want to be part of the game? You know, give me 50 bucks. And he's making it work. And so his name is still out there utilizing the relatively new media. And, uh, you know, it's working for him. You know, I do something as simple as a phone call, two phone calls once a week. And I record them, and then I book, make, put them in on my website, and I charge nine ninety five a month for it, a subscription fee, just like you know cable or Netflix. Uh, but this is giving people the opportunity to binge on uh, information, and you know I got five subscribers yesterday, and you know it's constantly growing. I just you know kick this off, so we have the ability now uh, with digital, the, in the digital age, if we can get out of the traditional media box and recognize it, we can start radio stations. I have a radio station called Gospel 1340. It's available on TuneIn Radio. And just as you can listen to a, a Radio One station or a Clear Channel station on an app, you can listen to my station on an app. It only costs me a few bucks a month. Um, and I'm working on a big deal with a big entity you know, to re uh, to rebrand it and do some things. So we don't have to stay chained to, and, and we have the same change as it relates to finance and, and so forth. Uh, it's called learned helplessness. It's something I talk about in what I do with my media. Uh, and that is where after repeated setbacks and failures to succeed and things happening like, you know, the elimination of the tax certificate, and uh, the FCC putting in laws that allow big companies to buy more radio stations where we can fall into a state of helplessness. It's like, uh, regardless of whether there is a way up and a way out and a way to do it differently, we don't believe there is. So we remain stuck, hoping, expecting and hoping that someone's gonna say, hey, I'm gonna help you out. When the vehicles now exist that didn't exist 20 years ago, where we can actually accomplish what the big folks are doing. Uh, and all we have to do is get an audience and get a revenue model. Um, so I would say now that we've talked about, you know, old media and traditional media and how they've locked everybody out. Now, what I'm asking folks to do is get out of that box. Don't expect that that is going to change because now you have the ability to be bigger. Now, I watched a, 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 a documentary on Netflix, uh, which was on Prime. So now these streaming services are coming up and they're giving the big companies, you know, some challenges like Comcast, who's a, a global behemoth. Com uh, so Netflix started out somebody's idea and they said, hey, you know, you got Blockbuster, who was the dominant player in video. Uh, you know, uh, you go to the store, you go to your Blockbuster, you get your popcorn, video, take home, and all. that was part of your life. And it shifted. Because someone said, well, maybe we can forget about the late fee thing. We'll just ship them a DVD. Now that this stuff's on a DVD and not a tape, let's try putting that in the mail. I'll send it to you, partner, and to see if it gets there intact. It did. So why don't we do this? And they started doing that. And then by 2007, they well, wait a minute, all this digital stuff has changed. They were thinking out of the box, why should we be sending these, 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 uh, these video discs, DVDs, we can send it digitally directly 
to their computers and they can watch movies there. It's called Netflix. Started, you know, 1990, in the late 1990s, changed their delivery system by 2007, you know, just 13 years ago, to streaming. And if you look at their market cap, how much that company is worth, that company is now worth about $215 billion. Comcast is worth about $210 billion. They have surpassed Comcast. Comcast, the theme parks, the trucks, you know, all the cables that they wired, um, you know, satellite dishes, you know, cable, uh, the NBC network, um, Universal Studios, and all the blockbuster movies. And Netflix has surpassed them in terms of its market value in just 13 years, actually just within the past eight months. And uh, there are entities like Facebook. My daughter went from Ford Motor to BM of the uh, motor vehicles to Facebook. Then back in 2005, what Facebook was, is college students just going on and seeing the faces of other college students. Uh, and my daughter now was, you know, was wooed away from Ford to Facebook. But Facebook, you heard me say that uh, Netflix is $215 billion. Facebook is valued at seven over $700 billion. Something that started on a college student's computer uh, within the past 20 years. So I make these, uh, give you these examples to say that we don't have to stay chained to uh, this old model. Uh, the actual, the way up and the way out is there, is already there, and it's a matter of us taking full advantage of it. As far as capital is concerned, we can amass the capital, uh, and in terms of taking advantage of new platforms to get our messages and entertainment information out.